My name is Bob Cavan, and I'm past president of the San Diego, Greater, Greater San Diego Association of Realtors uh, a couple of times. Uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of the real estate industry for more than 50 years as a realtor, developer, property manager, and CPA. Today I have the privilege of serving as the moderator for this very important conversation. And I know if you're in this room, you know why this is an important conversation and what you've been going through the last couple of years. We have two fantastic speakers joining us today to cover some of the issues we're seeing around evictions and what we can expect going forward. I'm very excited today. Uh, our first speaker is my daughter, Christine Lamarca and uh, she'll be followed by another one of our friends and my friend for many, many years, Gov Hutchinson, who is Assistant General Counsel at the California Association of Realtors. I'm sure you've all heard him many times before. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable with respect to this topic and many, many others. Christine is uh, the 2021-22 President of the California Rental Housing Association, representing over 20,000 members who collectively own over 575,000 rental housing units in California. She previously served as the 2018 president of the San Diego County Apartment Association, um, and now referred to as the Southern California Rental Housing Association. And uh, Christine is a property supervisor for the Cabana Company, uh, first joining, joining our company in 2002. She's also a CPA, but uh, definitely has practiced for the last 20 years in the real estate uh, industry and specifically the residential housing industry. Uh, it does say here that Christine is the manage, managing director of our private <coughs> real estate, our family's privately owned real estate portfolio. So it was good that I read this and found that I've been replaced. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't matter who you are, and I think everybody in this room knows that. Uh, everybody does what they have to do, from cleaning toilets to taking calls at 2 o'clock in the morning on the weekend. So if you're in this business, you know what it's all about. Uh, I was looking at some of the proposals uh, dealing with this topic, and I'm sure the government might even mention it, that there's a proposal up in Sacramento with this new session that uh, if you buy a new rental property, that they're going to pre propose preclude you from being able to evict for the first five years. Uh, if they really want housing in this state, they're not approaching it uh, from any direction, in my opinion, properly. The environmental laws are so ridiculous. The cost, I was just telling Christine, when I was doing subdivision maps in the 70s, we had two people at the most working on that, and it would cost me anywhere from three to $4,000 to get a subdivision map ready to file with the county. Today, you need over 100 people, and there's no way you can do it less for than a million dollars for the smallest subdivision. It's, uh, it's just totally out of control, and if anybody wants to know where the costs are, that's where they are. So, um, with that, I'm going to ask Christine to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Can you guys all hear everything in the back, I guess? I can hear myself. All right, fantastic. Um, I want to first thank you by, for the, uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation to be able to speak with you today. As he mentioned, I'm president of the California Rental Housing Association. I'm very happy to represent 20,000 members across the state of California who own and manage over 575,000 rental units. This membership consists primarily, and that means 65% or more of our members are mom and pop members who manage these properties on their own as a part of their investment portfolio and planning their entire lives. They wake up every day like members of this association, happy to provide housing to people and committed to providing that housing for people. Despite the complex environment that we're working in, they do what we do best on a daily basis, provide housing. No matter what year, 1970, 1990, 2008, or today, I can begin every one of the sentences or paragraphs that I've written to speak with you or to share with you today with three simple quotes. People are challenging, 
Government makes things more complicated, and together we're stronger. <laughs> Those are three core things that can be said in any year and always be the truth. Now more than ever, we need to be together. In 2018, and again in 2018, realtors and the rental housing providers, along with other allies, together defeated Prop 10 and Prop 21. Those two rent control measures were defeated through our associations working together as one solid voice on behalf of our members. The curated messaging we convinced voters throughout California overwhelmingly to vote against rent control. We convinced them that it was bad public policy and that it would increase the cost of housing in California. We were successful in that messaging and we defeated those propositions together. In 2020, however, the world changed. In January, and I say that specifically, in January of 2020, Governor Newsom signed into law AB 1482, a statewide mandated rent control initiative, which meant for most housing providers throughout California that they were gonna be limited to their rent controls of 5% and a CPI index based upon the area that they were managing their property. Then in March 2020, only a couple months later, we had COVID-19 put the world into a pandemic state. In our state, we went into lockdown. We forced people to go into their homes and stay at home based upon order of our government. Housing providers across the state were forced to balance the needs of their personnel, the health and wellness of our people who do our work on a daily basis with the needs of the people who are now sheltering in place and putting more wear and tear on everything in our property. As many of you know and are aware of, our reporters like tripled the month that people were home that first month. It was very, very difficult. But despite that risk, we continued showing up and doing what we do. We provide and maintain housing. Only now, with people out of work, we were expected to do this for 25 cents on the dollar, and in some areas of California, such as Los Angeles, zero dollars. We were not eligible for PPP loans, and we had no certainty how our residents were ever going to be able to catch up with their ever-growing rental debt. Rental housing providers across the state carried this financial burden of the pandemic while continuing to deliver the services that we promised under our rental agreements. Yes, many of us worried how we were going to continue to pay our expenses with little to no income coming in the door and no end in sight to the protections in place for renters with no consideration of the plight of the housing provider. Regardless of a resident's income, this is where this kind of starts tying in here. Regardless of a resident's income, or their behavior, we were expected to provide, they were, pro, they were provided protection from eviction by our legislature. The eviction moratoriums repeatedly were extended until September of 2021. Many of us were contending with renters who were not behaving very nicely with either us or with their neighbors, causing a lot of disruption in our communities, yet we were at hamstrung, could do nothing to, to take care of that problem. We were losing residents, good residents, because of bad residents, or we just all had to tolerate it. So after the extend, after the uh, September 30th, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to start this a little bit slower here. So most of our opinions, these policies went far too far. They, they pushed us to the limit. In August 2021, Calorie Che, on behalf of our members, filed a lawsuit against the governor and the state of California, citing the illegal taking of private property, contractual interference with our rental agreements, and violation of due process by allowing tenants to self-certify their financial reduction in income and increase in expenses related to the pandemic. Our legislature continually extended these moratoriums out of fear that there would be a tsunami of evictions, which may displace people and create more homelessness. Finally, in September 2021, the eviction moratorium ended. Why? As across, oh, excuse me, but across the U.S., including California, the eviction, it predicted eviction tsunami did not materialize. Why? We are in the business of housing people, not evicting them. We will work with our residents who are experiencing financial challenges, and we will continue to provide the housing. Despite a lot of supporting evidence that we prefer to keep people housed, cities like Chula Vista are committed to creating additional tenant protections 
This is happening throughout California. I use this as a local example because we are in San Diego right now, but this is happening throughout California. These cities are creating additional tenant protections that are excessive and irrational. In anyone's mind, would it ever be rational to give a 365-day notice to a resident and provide a, of them financial assistance to vacate a property? I shake my head. We as an industry need to be collectively pushing back against these irrational proposals while simultaneously elevating our own worth. Legislators everywhere need to continue, will continue to zero their sights on housing providers, which means that organizations like CAR, SDAR, CalRHA will need to be forever educating incoming and city leaders in local government and in Sacramento about the need to build more housing to, st to stabilize the cost of living. In this process, we need lawmakers to recognize and appreciate the value that housing providers create for California. We need to be beating our drums so consistently that they start to associate our contributions to the superior quality of life in California. Quality, reasonably priced housing options, and weather should make California the envy of the nation. Rent control is not the answer. In summary, I'm going to say that the pandemic has created new opportunities for us. And maybe opportunity is the wrong word, maybe motivation is the better word. But the ongoing state of emergency has caused, has created a, uh, it's consumed a lot of energy, basically, for the past two years. The legislators' approach to pro protecting the public was overreaching and created conflict be ho between housing providers, that's, that's either way, rental or, or for market purchase, and, and the leaders of our state. We disagree with the state's blanket approach to this eviction moratorium and the more restrictive rate controls and the ongoing disruption to operating our businesses. This is once again an opportunity for us to work together, just like we have on prior propositions, to increase the strength and protect the interest of our memberships and the residents of California that we serve by providing housing. The Calorie J lawsuit has been scheduled for a hearing in August, but win or lose this effort, we will establish that rental housing providers should not be burdened with providing housing and all the costs related thereto without compensation. We will defend our members' right to collect agreed upon rents and enforce the terms of our rental agreements. The lawsuit is not an easy decision. At the time, CalRHA did not have the financial legal defense plan in place. It was never part of our equation. We were about communication, collaboration, and education. Well, now we're about litigation, too. If we have to do this, and on behalf of our members, we will do this. We will raise the funds and we will continue to fight the fight. We did this because it was the right thing to do. Owners' rights across California will be stronger for this lawsuit, and I am proud to make the helm of the mission. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm honored and humbled to be working alongside you to share my passion for housing. Together we are so much stronger. Together we can affect change. Stay strong, stay committed, stay healthy, and we all need you to be in this fight with us. Thank you. I think everybody in this room probably realizes how different it is to be a uh, rental owner at this point in time. And I think, um, I know what our association is doing and what the apartment associations are trying to do. And I do think the elected officials in this state would do very well to sit and talk with us and deal with it. We're not against them. We are here providing the housing, as Christine stated. And the sooner they realize that, uh, and stop coming up with the ridiculousness. It, it just almost looks like they're, from my perspective, on a collision course to someday own all the rental property in the entire state. Uh, if they want to do it, I think they keep up with what they're doing at this point in time. And I think you, you all know that. But we have to be speaking out. You just can't sit back. I mean, I, I know I've been doing this for over uh, 55 years, actually. and. Uh, the more you get to know these elected officials, uh, the more they react, and uh, they react properly. It's just a shame what we're going through at this point in time in this country. In the entire time I've been in this industry, I've never seen anything as ridiculous as it is right now. We have to come together, we have to work together, because this is not on a good path. And, and you guys know as being realtors, as being involved with rental property, uh, you spend your life doing this, and you're not out here just trying to 
to, to make a dollar. You are out here really for a lot of really good reasons and to help people get into housing and keep them in the house and help them figure out ways to get, get rent or pay their rent. We, we certainly, uh, that's the last, last uh, thing we ever go to as far as uh, evictions. I mean, it's just, that's the last, last result. But anyway, I want to thank Christine, and she'll be here to answer some questions. But at this point in time, uh, I'm pleased to be able to announce that uh, our next guest is Governor Gov Hutchinson, uh, who will be joining us by Zoom. Gov's the Assistant General Counsel for the California Association of Realtors. He has been with CAR since 1985, CAR since 1985, and manages CAR's member legal services program in Los Angeles. Gov has joined us uh, on this program repeatedly over the many years, and we're grateful for all he does to educate us on the laws impacting our industry. Uh, as a reminder, again, if you have a question, put it on the cards, because that's always the best part of this, uh, this section, and so I, I can't stress enough to ask you to write a question if you have it, because we have people here who can answer those questions. And so with no more to go here, Gov, you're up. Thanks. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Good to be here. I'm really sorry I'm, I'm here by Zoom as opposed to in person, but it's sort of out of my control. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I don't know if you can see me or not, but anyway. Here I am in Los Angeles, this, um, and I want to just talk about, it won't take too long to talk about eviction issues and we can answer questions. As Bob said, I mean, there's, every year there's new proposals that we have to fight. I mean, he mentioned the one about proposed bill that would say he can't evict, you know, when you buy a property for five years. I mean, obviously that's going to be a strong priority on Sierra's part to oppose that. And any other, you know, we spend a lot of time opposing bad bills, and usually we're fairly successful uh, defeating some of them, if not most of them. But anyway, and we'll keep you updated on that. But my specific topic right now is. Uh, the latest on evictions, and, and <clears throat> Dr. Singh said the California official eviction moratorium ended at the end of September, but that didn't mean yet that we're back to pre, pre-COVID law, right? There's still some other things you still gotta know about. Uh, first of all, the good news is, unless you're in a city like Los Angeles, that has its own laws, and I'm not so sure, I never, I can't keep track of, you know, if San Diego, Chula Vista, whatever. But the basic good news was, about the end of the eviction moratorium was, that the limitations on evictions, on no fault evictions, are pretty much gone. Remember, up until the end of September, you had very narrow reasons why you could evict someone for no fault. Basically, <clears throat> you had to, you know, owner move in, mandatory repairs, or basically you were in contract to, to uh, sell to a buyer. Fortunately now, we're back to the way you were, unless you're in a city with its own rules like Los Angeles, you don't need a reason to evict someone, basically. <clears throat> if they're not doing anything wrong, you can pretty much evict them unless you're under the limitations of the California rent control law. So that's good. Remember one thing, <clears throat> one of the exemptions is single family homes. If I want to evict someone from a single family home, I don't need just cause. But I still run into situations where people don't know that in order to be able to evict someone from a single family home, you must have incorporated into your rental agreement a particular form, the RCJC. <clears throat> and that form basically is explaining to the, to the you know, explain to the tenant about this rule. So the bottom line is, if you haven't done it yet, make sure in your single family home, if you're renting out a single family home that you've incorporated, and it's not too late to incorporate it right now by just sending this form to your tenant, the RCJC, Rent Cap Just Cause <coughs> Addendum. Once you send that form, then you're able, unless your city prohibits it, you're able to evict someone from a single family home with just a 60 day notice or a 30 day notice if they've done that less than a year. Remember for like two years now, for two years until the end of September, you couldn't do that. So that's that's basically good news. If you're in Los Angeles, no, 
you still can't evict someone from a single family home unless you have <clears throat> unless it's an owner move in situation or they're or they're doing something wrong. But anyway, so that's good. But what about evicting people for non-payment of rent? Well, obviously the most important part of ending the eviction moratorium is that you can evict people for non-payment of rent even if they have a COVID situation. That's the overriding good news. But what's not back to normal yet is the paperwork you have to <clears throat> use to do this. First of all, let's say for some reason you're a landlord and the tenant still owes you rent from prior to October 1st, right? That you still haven't, I mean, you haven't gotten around to evicting them for pre-October 1st uh, debt. Well, remember, that was still under the old law. So if you're, for some reason, planning to evict someone for non-payment of rent prior to October 1st, you still have to use that 15-day uh, special COVID pay rent or quit notice, right? It's called the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's it's a specific form that basically, and, and you're still under the law that says if they were paying, you know, if, if they were behind in their rent prior to October 1st, if they had a COVID reason, they only had to pay 25%. So if they were paying the 25%, you still couldn't evict them. <clears throat> and this form, this 15-day uh pay rent or quit form basically tells them that and provides this declaration that they and that if they sign under under penalty of perjury saying they have a COVID reason, you still wouldn't be able to evict them today for non-payment of pre-October 1st rent as long as they're, they are, uh, they paid at least 25%. But let's assume you want to evict someone for rent that is owed after uh, October 1st. We're still not back to normal. In other words, you can still give them, you can now give them a three day notice to pay rent or quit, but you don't give them the traditional PRQ, pay rent, three day pay rent or quit. It's the PRQ CRQ. It's on zip forms if you see our forms. Uh, the whole point is <clears throat> right now, until the end of March, <clears throat> in order to evict someone, you first, as a landlord, have to apply for rental assistance. And this form sort of tells the tenant that. In other words, there's a website, housingiskey.com. You go there, you look up your city or your county, it'll show you how to start the process of applying for rental assistance. Because remember, there was money allocated, federal money was allocated to California and everywhere else to compensate landlords for tenants unable to pay their rent because of COVID. So even though we're past the end of the eviction moratorium, that money is still there until it runs out. And, and until the end of March, landlords still have an obligation to apply for that money before they can evict. So you go through your application and then they send an application to the tenant as well. You then can't do the eviction until either you're denied the rental assistance or the, you notify that the, te the tenant has not done their part within 20 days. So it's almost like everything is delayed at least 20 days. So it's probably a good idea to apply for the rental assistance before you want to start the eviction, right? Because there's definitely an obligation to do that uh, until the end of March. <clears throat> so it's not back to completely normal. It's a three-day notice rather than a 15-day notice, but it's not the regular three, the simple three-day pay rent or quit notice. We still have a slightly different form, and there is this obligation to apply for rental assistance till the end of March. Okay, so what about I've had a tenant who started after October first? In other words, up until now, I've been talking about tenancies that were in existence on October first. What if you got a brand new tenant that started after October 1st? Good news, you don't have to apply for rent. If they're not paying the rent, you don't have to apply for rental assistance before you can evict them. Bad news, not bad news, but something you should know, you still got to use that special three-day notice form though. In other words, even though it's a new tenant that started after October 1st, you start the process of eviction with a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, 
use the, uh, the new PRQ CRP until at least the end of March, but you do not have to apply for uh, rental assistance. I know what you're thinking, then why do I gotta use the special three-day notice? Well, that's just because that's the way the law works. So in other words, you do have a break. Now when, I, when we say new tenants, that means all the tenants started after October 1st. So if you had existing tenants that were there prior to October 1st, and then you got new tenants after October 1st, um, that you've added on to the existing ones, you're still under, <clears throat> you know, you still have to apply for rental assistance before you get paid. But if you have a completely brand new tenant after October 1st, and they don't pay the rent, and you want to evict, you don't have to apply for the rental assistance. However, um, you can, and also, uh, you have to use special three-day notice. And guess what? Any, even if the landlord doesn't have to apply for rental assistance, Tenants still can apply for rental assistance on their own until the end of March. Um, and obviously you can't double dip. I mean, if you get if you get the money or the tenant gets the rental assistance money, you can't evict them for not paying for them not paying that money. It doesn't matter where the money came from, they get the landlord got the money. Okay? So related tenant owes me back rent. I mean, it's not a question of eviction. Maybe they're already gone. Or they weren't paying prior to October 1st, but they're paying now. So I can't really evict them. But nevertheless, they owe me money, right? They owe me back rent. And even though it was during COVID times, you're allowed to sue them for that back rent. And remember, if it's prior to October 1st, they only had to pay 25%. So you can only, if they sign that declaration of the penalty of perjury saying they had a COVID reason, if they didn't sign that declaration, you can sue them for all the back rent. And since October 1st, obviously, uh, <clears throat> not only can you evict them, you can sue them for all the money they owe you. And the good news is, even if they owe you more than $10,000, you can go through small claims court. But of course, in order to sue someone for back rent right now, now, until March 31st, just like you have to apply for rental assistance to evict them, you have to apply for rental assistance to sue them for the back rent also. So this whole idea of applying for rental assistance until the end of March um, is, is something you got to deal with. Now, there's a, another issue. Okay, so they owe the rent, right? If you're in certain places like where I am, the city of Los Angeles, they've extended the date when the tenant has to pay back the back rent. So I'm assuming when I say you can sue them right now for all the back rent, I'm assuming you're not in a city like Los Angeles that has extended the deadline to pay back the back COVID rent. For LA, it's like next year. So, once again, um, it's not complete, we're not back to normal. Maybe in where you are, it's going to be back to normal April 1st. Uh, uh, depends upon where you are, of course. Um, that's an issue you got to deal with. Um, but uh, hopefully where you are, you're going to be getting back to normal. But things can always get extended. <clears throat> Bob and Christine were saying things get, keep getting extended. We never know what's going to happen next. Hopefully this is it, end of March. Obviously, to keep it posted. Another thing I always say to realtors is this is complicated stuff, and you may have a lot. You may have clients who are landlords, and they're going to look at you and say, "What form do I use? What do I? What can I do here?" Ideally, you're not the one who's giving them that advice. Ideally, they have their own advisor, their own lawyer. Of course, if a lot of you are probably property managers, in which case you do need to know this stuff because that is part of your job if you are getting paid to property manager. Plus, a lot of you are probably landlords yourself. Which, the next thing to tell you is, as a realtor, call the legal hotline when you have a question on this stuff. And we will walk you through what form you need, what the process is, and what you have to do. Okay? Um, and we're there for you. We have written materials on our website for members on the California rent control, on the update on the evictions, 
and we can send that to you and get those to your clients. And we can, of course, talk, we can't talk to your clients, but we can talk to you and help you walk you through this stuff um, if you have any questions. Now, a related issue that we keep getting asked nowadays is, are there any restrictions on my ability to increase someone's rent? Residential, can I count rent increases? Um, once again, it's complicated. It depends on where you are. If you're in certain places like where I am, the city of Los Angeles, um, you're under California, you know, a lot of the properties are under LA rent control. And if you're under LA rent control, you know, maybe there's a rent freeze, some places can increase the rent by a little bit, but you have to go with the local law. What if you're not under LA rent control? Well, everywhere in California, you might be under 1482, California rent control, which basically single family homes are exempt, owner occupied duplexes are exempt, buildings newer than 15 years are exempt. But what if you have an older than 15 year building and you want to increase your tenant's rent? You can, but the limit is 5% plus the inflation rate. And as you said, the inflation rate varies depending on where you are. But we're in San Diego. San Diego right now it's 4.1. What's five plus 4.1? 9.1. That's the maximum you can increase someone's rent if your property comes under the California rent control on an annual basis. But then you say, okay, great, I'm not under California rent control. I have a single family rental, or it's a building that's newer than 15 years, or it's an owner-occupied duplex. Therefore, are there any restrictions on me increasing someone's rent? Unfortunately, there still are restrictions because we have something in California called the anti-rent gouging law, which says if your property is in an area that's under a state of emergency, the anti-rent gouging laws kick in and you can only increase the rent by 10%. Now you're going to ask me, how do I figure out if I'm in a, a state of emergency the area that limits my ability to increase someone's rent? And these are typically resulting from fires, right? In other words, there's many places in California right now that are still under statewide or even local states of emergency based on fires that happened last year. And you can call the legal hotline to show you how to figure out if you're in one. But that got bad news for you. The entire state of California, okay, this, this, this penal code 396 that talks about anti-rent gouging laws says, basically, if you're in a state of emergency, issued on any level, including the federal level, you come under this rule that you can't increase your rent by more than 10%. Believe it or not, the entire country right now is still under a federal state of emergency related to COVID that's scheduled to expire February 24th. So, some people, I know lawyers who interpret it differently, <clears throat> but I feel very strongly and our Sierra's legal position is that this federal COVID state of emergency that expires, we hope, February 24th, triggers this California law that restricts your ability to <clears throat> increase someone's rent by more than 10%. So I wouldn't do that. You have done it. Tenant hasn't complained about it. Maybe you're okay, but I just wouldn't do it until at least February 24th, okay? So in other words, so what I'm really saying is, how much can I increase my rent? Well, if I'm in a city rent control area, whatever the city says. If I'm not in a city rent control, but my building's older than 15 years and I'm in San Diego, 9.1. If I'm anywhere else, 10 is the maximum. Hopefully this is all gonna change February 24th, which would mean on February 24th, you can increase someone's rent by as much as you wanted if you weren't under uh, California rent control, 1482.
Okay, very complicated. Once again, feel free to call the legal hotline. And if you're not in San Diego, not in, uh, San Diego County, there may be a different uh, inflation factor that you have to add to the 5%. Right? LA, it's 3.6, so it's 8.6. So it's, it varies. Okay, so call the hotline or talk to your own lawyer before you raise someone's rent pay is what I was I'd advise right now. The last thing I want to mention before we open for questions, there's a new law related to this. Um, before January 1st, the California rent control law didn't apply to mobile home parks. It does, it does now. I don't mean there's California rent control regarding how much the park can charge the owner for occupying the space. What I'm saying is, if you're renting a mobile home in a mobile home park from the park, because you know a lot of times a mobile home park owns some of their mobile homes in the park and they rent them out. Until this year, they were not limited by how much rent they could charge. They are now. So in other words, they come, they, they now also come under the California rent control law, which limits it to 5% uh, plus inflation, which this year in San Diego is, is 4.1, total of 9.1. And, and that, that applies, believe it or not, even if the property is newer than, the mobile home is newer than 15 years, okay? So that's the latest. I think uh, we can open up for questions now. Um, by the way, later on today, in an hour from now or something like that, I'm gonna be giving a longer uh, legal update, talk about all sorts of new laws, not just the ones related to eviction, so hope to see some of you there. But uh, Bob, do you have any questions or anything you wanna, wanna address? Okay, this is, a, this is a good question, and this is uh, probably for you, Bill. Uh, has the legislature figured out that landlords are raising rents faster than ever because of rent controls and eviction moratoriums? I, I, I presume that means on our 5% plus the 4.1. Right. right. We try to convey that message. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, as you know, we oppose, CROs oppose the rent control things and restrictions like this. So, um, uh, yeah, that's that's the message that, that's part of the message we try to convey. That's all I can say. Good question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question for myself, yeah. Erica, that I've been thinking about. When we see that inflation rate in the country has gone up 7%, and we see that it's gone up probably faster than that in California, uh, let's assume nothing changes uh, and we end up with a 7%. Uh, could you just explain what's going to happen with respect to uh, this 5 plus 7 takes us to 12 and the 10% yes. limitations and so on? Yes, sorry, but thanks, Bob, for reminding me that I should have mentioned to all you guys. When I say you can increase it five plus inflation, there's a cap of 10. So as Bob said, inflation this year is more than, it's gonna be more than five, which means people are hopefully gonna be able to raise their rent by 10%, but not more than So yeah, that's a problem. Maybe we try to get the law amended to tweak that, but thanks for reminding me to, to remind all of you that when I say five plus inflation, there's a cap on that. 10%. As I said, hopefully on the uh, February 24th, at least there will be no more cap on non-California rent control properties, but we'll, we'll just stay tuned on that. I mean, if you guys have learned one thing in the last two years, is you have to be nimble and ready to adapt, because things just keep changing. I mean, <clears throat> COVID rules keep changing, landlord tenant laws keep changing, so things just keep Keep evolving. You just have to stay, keep attending meetings like this, and stay tuned to what, what the association tries to send to you. Read your email from the DAR because we try to tell you immediately. <clears throat> I'll tell you another thing I was just changing tomorrow that I'll talk about uh, at the later meeting today is the rules on uh, masks wearing in offices. Changing tomorrow. So uh, <clears throat> things just, in certain areas, things just keep changing. We're all, we're all anxious to get back to normality. And hopefully that's going to happen sooner rather than later, but for now you just got to stay tuned. That's all I can say. 
This is going to be the last question because then we're going to have a 10 minute break. There's snacks in the lobby and then Hill will be back next door in the, in the large room to talk about new laws. Sorry that we got behind and we'd like to have more of these questions. But uh, I have tenants who have begun to receive future rent through rental assistance paid directly to the tenant instead of the landlord. What is the penalty to the tenant for not paying <laughs> that to the landlord? Uh, and can you evict them? Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, it is true that tenants can actually apply for a certain amount of future rent until the money runs out. If they've done that, of course, I don't know what to tell you. they got to pay the rent. It's not for their own fun and game. So obviously, if they don't pay, you can evict them. I know what you're thinking. Can I sue the tenant for them to give me the money that they got directly from the government because that's my money. They owe me that money. That's rental money. And uh, you can try, but I'm not optimistic. <laughs> you can evict them, sure. But can you get your hands on the money that they got? And the whole reason they got the money was to pay you rent? Uh, and then they didn't pay you? Clearly, you can evict them. Uh, I think you should try suing them for the money. I mean, <clears throat> why not, right? I mean, it, it, be, it doesn't cost you too much of a legal cost, but yeah, that's, that's a problem. That's, that's a good question. That, that is a good question, and I, and I can tell you where we've even had to pay directly to us. We've had tenants asking if we could give them the excess back. <laughs> uh, I guess you all have the, the answer to that. Anyway, so we're going to take a 10 minute break and uh, we'll be in the next room with Gov. Gov, thanks a lot. Chris, thanks a lot. Uh, I wish you guys all the questions, but we'll get you ready to go. Thank you.